Hey friends, welcome to Wesleyan Theology to Undeniably Bless Your World. I'm Superintendent Mark Adams, Dr. Mark Adams, with the Network of Undeniable Blessing at the Free Methodist Church. And we've put together a series of lectures, a list of reading, some assignments, and a test that we believe will help equip you to understand Wesleyan theology in preparation for your journey as a leader and as a pastor in the Methodist movement. What we hope to accomplish during this particular series of lectures is to provide you with an overview of Wesleyan theology, the perspective of John Wesley, those that follow the Methodist movement, and of course, the Free Methodist Church USA. Not just to know what it is to think Wesleyan, but to embrace the Free Methodist way, the Methodist mind and heart and a passion for practical disciple making and the multiplication of leaders in churches. In this way, we believe that as you complete this course, Wesleyan Theology to Undeniably Bless Your World, you will be a more effective spiritual leader, more effective pastor perhaps, and you will undoubtedly be better equipped to undeniably Bless your world. Pretty excited about all of the classes that we'll be taking together. We have a number of instructors, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Today, not only am I, uh, Mark Adams, introducing this class, but we'll also be talking about the life and impact of John Wesley. Now, all the lectures are going to be about 30 to 40 minutes. So sit down and prepare yourself as we engage theologically, from a Wesleyan perspective, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, embracing the Trinity, understanding the nature of humanity, both the Imago Dei and our sinful nature, prevenient grace, justification by faith, sanctifying grace, even looking at eschatology, the last things, understanding from a Wesleyan perspective the nature and authority of Scripture in ways that we can uh, view that interpret it through what's called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. We'll be exploring the differences between uh, John Wesley and John Calvin, two kind of competing perspectives theologically that are um, very common uh, in the United States and around the world. We'll be looking at how Wesley approached faith and science, not an unimportant issue in our day, the way that Wesley and Wesleyan theologians and the Methodist Church of the Years have embraced and approached the idea of social justice. And then finally, uh, most practically and perhaps engaging as you lead your church, the Wesleyan theological view of disciple making, how we make and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Leading all of these lectures are a diverse array of pastors from the Network of Undeniable Blessing, the Free Methodist Churches in Northern California and Nevada. And you will discover deep insights from the amazing Ben Martinez, pastoring from Hayward, uh, California at the Hayward Free Methodist Church, also a uh, church planter, uh, business leader, and leading missions and church planting movements in the Philippines, as well as pastoring here in the USA. James Lackey is a church planter, pastor, assistant superintendent, sociology professor, school board leader in his community in Oroville, California, and so much more. You'll really appreciate his engaging insights. Jennifer Starr Revet is leading in Turlock, California. She has a vast experience as a church planter, a pastor, engaging even uh, at the highest levels of leadership in Washington, D.C. She is also an assistant superintendent in our network of churches. You will appreciate her insights. I'm teaching Dr. Mark Adams, superintending the Network of Undeniable Blessing. I've superintended for eight years in the upper Midwest of the uh, North Central Conference and uh, pastored for decades in Chicago, uh, leading there, also teaching at Garrett uh, Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, that's also where I received my doctorate 
Uh, and we have Stuart Welch, who is uh, leading out of Modesto, California, with a long and fruitful ministry as a church planter, pastor, and business leader, owning and operating one of the most successful security businesses in Northern California, also having served as a police officer in Oakland, California for many, many years. Stuart is an engaging and amazing leader. I know you can hardly wait to hear from him. Benga Adeshida leads in Pleasant Hill, California. He also has been a church planter. Do you see a theme here? Almost everybody in the network of undeniables they must be able to plant churches. That is, proclaim the good news of Jesus, make disciples, multiply groups, leaders, and churches. And Benga is among these. He's also an IT leader at the University of Berkeley, California. And then finally, last but certainly not least, is uh, Sam Manu, who is leading the West Coast Celebration Church in San Mateo, California. Probably the most diverse and youngest church in our network. Sam, a uh, Tongan by birth and uh, bringing his incredible insights, love for family and love for Jesus, will be bringing you incredible insights regarding some of the practical ways in which we can embrace Wesleyan theology and see it permeate how we do things in practical and fruitful ways. Now, each one of these teachers, myself included, will be using different formats. And so every lesson, every lecture you see will look a little different, sound a little different. The formats would be a little different. We embrace this as the most diverse network, at least right now, in the Free Methodist Church USA. We want to empower people where they are, doing things as they do, led by the Holy Spirit, in ways that are comfortable for them and yet fruitful in their context. So while the format is different, and while some of what you see will sound a little different, uh, all of this is a cohesive plan to bring you Wesleyan theology to be an undeniable blessing to your world. There are some books that are necessary to be read for this course. These include The Theology of John Wesley, Holy Love and the Shape of Grace by Kenneth J. Collins, several of selected 44 sermons by John Wesley, and a plain account of Christian perfection by John Wesley. These books are required reading, and you can find on our website links to purchase or, in many cases, download these texts as well. Now, we will be asking you also to complete a paper and or video message. The paper should be no longer than three pages, double-spaced, with title and please include your name. Or a video message that's no longer than 20 minutes and please identify yourself in the video. A few choices for topic of your paper. One choice, the Wesleyan way of salvation. Another, just choose a contemporary issue. And as you do, try to tie this into Wesleyan theological perspectives. And then, finally, disciple-making, Wesley style. How can you take the principles and practices of John Wesley, Wesleyan theology, and the Methodist Church to apply them to making disciples, shaping and forming followers of Jesus today? And then, finally, there's a test that you must pass in order to earn credit for this class. The Wesleyan Theology exam, all of the texts that I've mentioned above, and all of the requirements for writing a paper and submitting a video and or the paper are located at theology. I thought it would be helpful for us as we begin to introduce this class to simply pray in the same way as John Wesley has taught us to pray, and I would encourage you to pray with me this bold and undeniably powerful prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. 
praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. The covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. This prayer, I believe, captures the heart of the Wesleyan movement and the best of Wesleyan theology, where Christ is all and in all and for all. And our lives ought to be yielded before the glorious will of Jesus Christ, whatever that may be for our lives. Let me introduce this class to you. Wesleyan theology is an incredible gift to the world. It is intensely biblical. The theology of John Wesley is based on scripture and reason and tradition and experience. But the Bible is primary. John Wesley indicated boldly at one point, I am a man of one book. I did some research in my graduate studies and learned as I looked at the content of the writings of John Wesley, particularly his sermons, that they are approximately 70 to 80 percent biblical references, even when not referenced. A scholar of John Wesley once said his blood ran biblene, and there is no doubt that this is true. But not only did John Wesley bring deep biblical understanding to his theological principles, he was spirit-driven, spirit-led, full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I believe that a most significant impact of John Wesley's theology was the allowance for the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not just in thinking, but in living out that which has been thought or uh, discerned through theological practice. Even today, the Pentecostal movement has its roots in John Wesley's theology in the Methodist Church. Having noted that the Bible is paramount for Wesleyan theology, but primarily when infused by the Holy Spirit, it's also critical to point out that John Wesley was not really a systematic theologian. He was rather a practical theologian. Virtually all of what he taught and did were intended to be able to be acted upon and answered primarily the questions of practice in his time and day, and thank goodness very much for our own time and day as well. So John Wesley was a practical theologian, and when we place his thought systematically into topics like God, Trinity, Scripture, that's not something John Wesley himself ever did. So we're drawing from his rich resources and framing it as theological systems when Wesley himself intended his theology to be intensely practical that answered real questions for the real world using the real Holy Spirit illuminating the real Word of God. One of the amazing gifts of Wesleyan theology is how incredibly balanced it is. It is not esoteric. It is not merely practical. It does not lead us to have merely a life of prayer or merely a life of action, merely a life of intellect. No, it's all quite balanced. One of the things that drew me as a new follower of Jesus to the Wesleyan movement, the Wesleyan church, the Free Methodist Church in specific, was how intensely balanced Methodist theology, Wesleyan theology really is. There is an incredible power to knowing that our, our mind can be illuminated by the Scripture, that our heart can be set on fire by the Holy Spirit, and that our hands are empowered to do the works of Christ and to bear fruit 
for the kingdom. This balance that we have in Methodist theology has given it a robust impact, as we will see throughout this section of our lectures today. Ultimately, Wesleyan theology is a theology of grace and love. And you will see this writ large as you continue on. I have this interesting picture, something you may have seen a time or two in your life. I don't know what you see when you first look at it. Some would see a chalice or a cup. Some would see two faces looking at one another. The reason that I share this as we introduce Wesleyan theology is because, indeed, Wesley was very keen on ensuring that people were heard regardless of their perspective. And even as we look at this particular image, looking at the cup or the chalice, it draws to mind that Wesley, Wesleyan theology and its practical nature was very oriented around the church. And in particular for Wesley, communion was the primary sacrament of the church, demonstrating in practical and real ways the love of Jesus Christ for all of us that continues in and through us even to this day. Uniting all of what Wesley taught and did, however, was love. And the image of two faces reminds me very much of the intimacy and love that we can have with God the Father, He with us as Abba, Father, and we with one another as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Looking at this uh, psychological image, which has been used in many different studies to look at the way different people process information, visual stimuli, and can hold two competing ideas uh, in their mind, reminds me also of an incredible quote from John Wesley in On Bigotry, where he wrote, Give me your hand. I do not mean be of my opinion. You need not. I do not expect it or desire it. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. I cannot. Keep your opinion, and I will keep mine. And that, as steadily as ever. You need not endeavor to come over to me or bring me to you. Only give me your hand. We must act as each is fully persuaded in their own mind. Hold fast that which you believe is most acceptable to God, and I will do the same. Let all the smaller points stand aside. If your heart is as my heart, if you love God and all humankind, I ask no more. Simply. Give me your hand. I love this, not only text, but basic fundamental philosophy of John Wesley, which yielded a great deal of impact as Wesley began to come upon the face of the earth and to allow God to use him in mighty ways. Now, I'm going to give you just a very whirlwind intro to John Wesley, the life of the man who, by the way, was born into a family of 19 children, most of whom did not survive, with his father and mother, Susanna and Samuel Wesley. Also, among the children of Susanna and Samuel was Charles Wesley. Those two together became quite the dynamic duo in leading the Methodist movement, which came essentially out of the Anglican Church, Thanks be to God for our roots. John and Charles Wesley both attended Oxford University. John and Charles Wesley were Oxford educated, and uh, John, in fact, taught at Oxford at Lincoln College. And while there, they formed the Holy Club, uh, where they were first called Methodists. A funny little ditty was uh, sung about the Methodists at Oxford. By rule they eat, by rule they drink, by rule they do all things but think. Accuse the priests of loose behavior to get more in the layman's favor. 
Method alone must guide them all, when themselves Methodists they call. Any club called the Holy Club is probably going to get a few folks thinking that you're holier than thou. But the Methodists in the Holy Club before there was even a movement of the Holy Spirit in a way that we would understand it, were fully devoted to trying to follow and pattern the life after Jesus Christ. They were tracked their hours to ensure that there was no idle time. They studied their scripture uh, diligently and uh, memorized scripture in Hebrew and Greek. They ensured that they were providing uh, as much out of their limited means as possible to the poor and to provide aid to those in desperate need. They visited prisoners. They taught orphans. They fasted on Wednesday and Friday. Jesus the commands of Scripture are extraordinarily seriously. And these earnest men were eventually sent to Savannah, Georgia, as missionaries. John and, and Charles Wesley ended up trying to lead indigenous people of Georgia to faith in Jesus, while also serving uh, Governor Oglethorpe in Georgia. It didn't go well, but I will point this out before leaving the, the Holy Club group, that there were a number of significant leaders in, their, in the 18th century church that were formed as part of this Holy Club at Oxford, including uh, John Gamble, the uh, bishop of the Moravian movement, John Clayton, a significant Anglican theologian, Ben Ingram, a uh, profound British evangelist, and perhaps at, at least for those that live in the United States, like I do, uh, George Whitfield, who became one of the most prominent and amazing evangelists of his era and of our country in its early formation. So these and, and many more had their uh, founding roots, cut their teeth, so to speak, and taken Jesus seriously with the Wesley brothers in Oxford. But as John Wesley was returning to England uh, from Georgia, dejected at having had limited success, he wrote in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me. Uh, an amazing, and I'll condense the story, event took place when a mighty storm arose on the boat, and uh, it was a very uh, life-threatening and terrifying experience for John Wesley. But he noticed some Moravian, the offshoot of the Lutheran Church, Moravians, who were in fact calm and praying and studying Scripture and seemed not to fear even death itself. And this profoundly moved John Wesley, who upon return to England began to connect with the Moravians for Bible study in a number of places, including Gate Street, England, where London, England, where on May 24, 1738, um, he saw the light of his need to understand that salvation is not something that can be earned through your works, your deeds, seeking perfection through doing all the right things. And mind you, he had tried to do all the right things. The Holy Club was the epitome of all the right things, and yet his heart had not experienced uh, the fullness and peace of Jesus Christ. And his compare and contrast with the Moravians brought that home for him. But then, uh, on May 1738, I write, I read from Wesley's journal, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This transformative experience for John Wesley led to a change in his life as a churchman ordained in the Church of England, still very much believing in all of the sacraments and practices of the church, began to uh, break stride with normal practice uh, and proclaim Jesus in the open air uh, to miners on their lunch break on hillsides in Bristol, England, to wherever he could bring the good news of Jesus Christ. 
he would do so. And his public open air preaching, along with the singing of his brother Charles, who was converted just shortly before Wesley's own conversion. Charles was an amazing musician and would put the song, the theology that would transform lives forever. And as they would sing and proclaim Jesus, hundreds and thousands of people became followers of Jesus with their lives transformed and a true movement began. By the way, the picture behind me is what remains of the uh, Aldersgate Street um, home where uh, Wesley and his Moravian friends would pray uh, in London, England. There's much about the uh, story and history of the Methodist movement, which is worth noting, but I'm simply going to say that uh, perhaps the most profound aspect of Wesleyan theology was this awareness or understanding that in order to be a follower of Jesus, to live out that which the scripture teaches, uh, you must in fact do it in community. There is no Holiness, but social holiness, says John Wesley. And by that, he did not mean political movement, social holiness. He meant the holiness that we engage as we gather together, holding each other accountable for our walk with Jesus and encouraging each other with scripture, through prayer, and through the love that can only happen in real community with real people together. The Methodist movement began to grow, became strong and multiplicative through the formation of bands, classes, and societies. The bands were three to five people that would regularly gather to share their experiences with one another, to encourage each other, to live out their faith and holiness. Uh, classes were slightly larger groups of 10 to 12, sometimes a little bit more. Uh, men and women not together, but in their own separate groups, receiving spiritual guidance from a class leader. And Wesley would, would be rolling in his grave today if he knew how many pastors were leading these small groups or classes. They were intended to be a lay-empowered movement, and laity were intended to be leading these uh, class meetings where people would watch over one another in love and account for sin and holiness with scripture as the guide and the spirit as the empowerment. And uh, bands would gather together in classes. Classes would gather together and form societies, gatherings of multiple classes for worship and fellowship, preaching and teaching. Although in the early uh, Methodist movement, not for sacrament, that was intended to be done in the church and the societies were renewal movements within the Church of England. Although when Methodists were not welcome in the Church of England, they began to form as their own churches. These innovations, the practical aspect of Wesleyan theology led to incredible growth in the movement. When Wesley died on March 2, 1791, Surrounded by friends, he was able to say after a life of both great victory and great struggle, he had been ostracized for so much of his life by his Anglican peers, not really welcome. His innovations were not really welcome, but as more and more Methodists grew and as the Church of England began to experience renewal, he became a respected British statesman. As a matter of fact, his portrait now hangs in the hall of the Oxford Dining Hall, which I showed you a little bit earlier. Wesley's parting words for all of us was, best of all, God is with us. The impact that John Wesley uh, and the Methodist Church has had is quite profound. It extends far beyond the religious contributions, although that is mostly what we're studying in uh, our classes today. But John and his brother Charles and the Methodists were tireless in preaching and writing and organizing. They left an indelible mark on the word through not just theology, but also social reform and education, contributions to science and to music. The theological teachings revolutionized Christianity at the time, particularly within the Anglican Church, but around the world. The basic concept that one must have personal faith in a personal God, a primary tenant of the evangelical movement today, was brought to life with real power through the Wesleyan movement.
empowerment of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Spirit in ways that today we would say were clearly charismatic, uh, were uh, incredibly important to the early Methodist movement, who often got the, the, the title Holy Rollers, and that for a reason. Although John Wesley was a man of significant order, nonetheless, there was no stopping outflows of the Holy Spirit that were uncontainable. The way that Wesley developed his bands and classes and societies was organizational genius, uh, which continues to impact churches today in profound ways. But perhaps in terms of a theology, the most important contribution of John Wesley is this concept of Christian perfection or of Christian holiness that is actually attainable in the world today, not through our actions, but received by grace through faith. Wesleyan theology is almost certainly the most optimistic theological framework in Christendom today. There is an actual belief and many have experienced a fullness of the Holy Spirit, which can lead to manifestations of spiritual gifts. Uh, but that's not the emphasis of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. For Wesley, and indeed we believe for Scripture, it is a fullness of love. The idea that you can receive by grace through faith the gift of the fullness of the Holy Spirit that allows you not just to try to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, but actually love God, and not just try to love God your neighbor as you love yourself, but actually love your neighbor. This fullness of love is the heart, of the optimistic heart, the incredibly profound heart of Wesleyan theology, that you really can be so full of Christ that Christ lives in and through you, and that is expressed above all through love. Now, I just want to point out a few aspects of the impact of John Wesley and of his life. Um, just a couple of interesting fun facts. In a single year, he walked 1,500. He was both educated and taught at Oxford. He founded schools for orphan boys, and he wrote their textbooks. He founded free, free medical clinics, the very first of their kind, recognizing the importance of education, John Wesley established schools and educational institutions. He believed that education was essential for personal and societal improvement. For example, the Kingswood School, founded by John and Charles Wesley, provided education to children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who otherwise cannot receive education and yet through this means could become leaders in their communities, significantly impacting the world. Uh, when we think of the Wesleys, uh, Oxford-educated Wesleys, it's critical to recognize that not only did they believe that education was important, but they believed in making it practically available to as many people as possible, especially to the poor. John Wesley also was quite significant in his writing and contributions to the world of both science, literature, as well as theology. He published 233 original works on a variety of subjects. And again, not just the Bible, but the four-volume history of England, a scientific treatise on fauna, birds, beasts, and insects. Primitive Physique, it was the most popular home medical guide of the time. John Wesley was both uh, a product of and the antithesis to the Age of Enlightenment. He embraced both theological truth embodied in Scripture and general empirical truth that could be experienced through the emerging fields of science in his day. And he continued uh, in the, he contributed significantly to the fields of natural science in substantial ways. I, I just wanted to point out this picture. That is a life-size wax reproduction of John Wesley next to me. I am not large. Well, I'm large around, but I'm only about five feet, seven inches tall. 
And uh, I towered over the life-size replica of John Wesley. It just shows dynamite comes in small packages. And this diminutive physical man uh, was truly a giant in his day in so many ways. I mentioned that he really enjoyed science. One of our lectures uh, will be on John Wesley and the embrace of science in the age of faith. But I think it's interesting to note that he followed very closely the work of electricity, particularly that of American Benjamin Franklin. Mind you, John Wesley was British through and through. But some good things even come from the colonies in his day. And he, Wesley, invented an electrical machine, and he reported about 1,000-plus people uh, cured as a result of his work with electricity. Although this is an early form of uh, electroconvulsive shock therapy and quite innovative in his day. Wesley very clearly also was a social reformer, not just engaged in the worlds of uh, science and uh, natural philosophy and history, but also in making a real difference. Uh, we've already talked about his impact regarding education for poor children in specific and uh, insisting that his pastors learn to be readers. Uh, that was quite important for the early Methodist movement. But his social reform, his agenda on care for the poor, providing medical care for those who had no access to it, and, and even opposing slavery in his day are quite significant. His last written letter on his, uh, not quite deathbed, but uh, near there, uh, was to William Wilberforce, a name you might recognize from British Parliament as the key uh, abolitionist figure of the day, leading the British government to outlaw slavery uh, well before the United States did. It took uh, a civil war in the United States before that would happen. But it's instructive to hear the words of John Wesley as he uh, writes to William Wilberforce. He says, uh, Dear Sir, this is from February 24, 1791. Dear Sir William Wilberforce, unless the divine power has raised you up to be as Athanasius against the world, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that execrable villainy, which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. That villainy is, of course, uh, slavery. Wesley goes on, unless, Sir Wilberforce, unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and the power of his might till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. Reading this morning a tract wrote by a poor African, I was struck by the circumstance that a man who has a black skin being wronged or outraged by a white man can have no redress it being a law in all of our colonies that the oath of a black man against a white goes for nothing. What villainy is this? That he who has guided you from youth may continue to strengthen you in this and all things is the prayer of, dear sir, your affectionate servant, John Wesley. As we've seen Wesley's incredible impact in theology, in practical natures of church, in science, uh, natural philosophy, social reforms, uh, it is also important to point out that uh, Methodism is a singing religion, and uh, John was accompanied by his brother Charles, uh, usually very much together. 
um, not always seeing eye to eye, but usually very much together uh, in terms of theology and the practical nature of church. But Charles Wesley was a profound musician, and the hymns of the Wesleys, Charles in specific, had a profound impact on Christian worship and music, even to today. Charles Wesley's prolific output included 6,000 hymns with timeless titles like Hark the Herald Angels Sing and Can It Be, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Um, these songs continue to inspire and uplift congregations worldwide. And perhaps you've sung them yourself. When Charles was converted to faith in Jesus, he wrote the song, And Can It Be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who scorned his perfect love. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, wouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, wouldst die for me? I love that song. A year later, by the way, uh, John and Charles were remembering their uh, conversions together and wrote the song that uh, would become the number one song, uh, not only in popularity in the, in the time, but also literally number one. It's the number one song in almost every Methodist hymnal um, from the uh, early formation of the Methodist movement through the end of the 19th century. And that number one song is, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Uh, 18 stanzas originally, and uh, commemorating a one-year anniversary of salvation by grace through faith. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my dear Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. And what would Christmas be without hark the herald angels sing? Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. And what would Easter be without Christ the Lord is risen today. I could go on and on. The impact of the Wesleys on worship, the music of worship, and the way that we encapsulate and capture uh, our theology today through song is profound. And if not the words themselves, the very idea that an evangelistic, spirit-filled movement must be accompanied with songs which ignite the heart as well as inspire the mind uh, continue to be one of the most significant impacts of the Wesleyan movement for us today. Now, I'm going to close out this little section introducing the impact of the Wesleys and Wesleyan theology with just a, a few quotes. I love these quotes from John Wesley, and perhaps you've heard them too. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Have not, you have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. And go not to those that need you, but to those that need you most. It is not your business to preach so many times and take care of this or that society, but to save as many souls as you can, to bring as many sinners as you possibly can to repentance. And Wesley's perspective on education and knowledge, um, we could provide so many quotes, but I just love these uh, three little ones that I, I believe you'll appreciate as well. It cannot be that the people should grow in grace unless, unless they give themselves to reading. A reading people will always be a knowing people. And elsewhere, Wesley says, and I love it, but think and beware 
that you be not swallowed up in books. An ounce of love is worth a pound of knowledge. And finally, just a couple more. Having first gained all you can and secondly saved all you can, then give all you can. I've already quoted this. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social. Again, intended to keep us together in community. And in this regard, by the way, we will be engaged in the world around us. And a fun quote that uh, is often attributed to anybody but John Wesley. Sometimes it's even attributed to Abraham Lincoln or the Bible, but it's not. John Wesley said, cleanliness is next. For me, as a superintendent of churches, as somebody who has pastored for decades, uh, has been a church planter, uh, this is uh, a quote from John Wesley that I've taken to heart day in and day out. Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Indeed, in the network of undeniable blessing, the majority of those that are planting churches and uh, commissioned as pastors in communities are not ordained clergy. They may be on the path to ordination, uh, but that's a long path. They are lay persons, lay men and women, uh, carpenters, house cleaners, store managers, teachers who are empowered by the Holy Spirit to share the good news of Jesus and fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Consequently, uh, we've been able to see some significant growth in the network of undeniable blessing just living out the basic tenets of scripture and clinging to Wesleyan theology in significant and real practical ways. As we conclude, the impact of John Wesley, Wesleyan theology upon the world has been profound. We are just one, the strand of Wesleyan theology and of Methodism is just one of uh, many different strands within the Church of Jesus Christ. And uh, even as I uh, began the lecture, John Wesley understands that. And uh, just give me your hand. We don't have to think or, or do the same things. Just let us follow Jesus together, loving God and loving neighbor. But the family tree of the Methodist Church is significant uh, to the degree that today there are over 80 million people in the world that, that would refer to themselves as Methodists of one stripe or another. 13 million of those are in the United Methodist Church, the largest single Methodist group, a merger of the United Brethren and Methodist Episcopal Church in the mid-1900s. But in, in terms of the Methodist impact, there are over 80 denominations in 138 uh, countries around the world. We have a global impact, and the Methodist movement continues to shape the world. The statue uh, behind me is at uh, Wesley's Chapel in John Wesley's house at 49 City Road in London, and uh, upon the pedestal um, is emblazoned that great quote from John Wesley, the world is my parish. But it's not insignificant to point out that uh, today in the world, Christianity continues to grow. It is not shrinking. It continues to grow. It's growing at a rate of almost 2% a year, according to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And there are over two and a half billion people that are followers of Jesus one way or another. Uh, without a doubt, the largest of that group are uh, Roman Catholics. However, the fastest growing groups are evangelical and charismatic. The Methodist movement was one of the most significant and profound of the early evangelical movements, evangelical being characterized not today as it so often is with a political affiliation, but with an understanding or a belief that the Bible is the very word of God and that it reveals to us Jesus Christ as the very Son of God, that the evangel, the good news, is that Jesus saves us and salvation, eternal life, is found through faith in Jesus Christ 
alone. And with these basic tenets empowered by the Holy Spirit, it continues to be a profound impact in the world, as you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. While John Wesley had very strong, very clear, very methodical ways of making disciples, it was very clear to him that religion per se was by no means salvation. It is something that comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But that empowerment of the Holy Spirit is a very critical thing. The evangelical church is one of the fastest growing in the world, but the fastest growing is the charismatic movement. And the charismatic or Pentecostal movement, which accounts for approximately one quarter of the two and a half billion Christians in the world today and continues to outpace every other aspect of, of Christian growth in the world has its roots in Methodism. The Pentecostal, Holy Spirit-filled movement has its roots in Methodism, in the theology and practice of John Wesley. And when John Wesley says the world is his parish, and with the impact that he brings to all of us, it's uh, critical to understand that's not an impact that was for the 18th and then maybe 19th century, but that the theology, the practices, the social reforms, educational priorities, but above all, uh, a heart of love and a belief that the Holy Spirit can so radically transform a soul as to create within it a living image of Christ who loves God and loves neighbor in reality. Perhaps the world would be your parish too, and as we dive deeper into the theological nuts and bolts, of Wesleyan theology, may you experience it as an undeniable blessing and take it to undeniably bless.